Thanks for joining. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Steve Schwartz. I run the LSAT blog. I also host the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. And I'll get into my story more in a moment, but Chris, first I want to invite you to introduce yourself. As you guys know, I'm Chris, Chris Osakusi. Um, I am a first year, finished up my first year at Windsor Law this past year. Also play football in my spare time and also the organizer and founder of Switch Mentality. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining. I'm very interested to hear more about your athletic experiences because I think a lot of that does tie into LSAT prep or pursuing any difficult task like that, that mentality. And so I'll be very interested to hear a little more about that. Uh, I'll talk for a few minutes on my own LSAT journey and then we'll, we'll take it from there as we discussed. So I've been teaching the LSAT since 2005, but I really never thought I'd be doing this. I went to an Ivy League undergrad, I thought I was going to go to a top 14 law school, but the LSAT was just this one exam that I could not crack. I took exam after exam after exam. I measured my results. I'd be happy or sad about them, and then I would simply move on to the next thing. But my scores did not budge. I kept scoring in the low 150s, and the average LSAT scores of 151, so it was decent, but not suitable for a top score. So I realized there's a distinction between what I call now the obsessive practice exam narrative, the idea of obsessing over taking these timed exams versus what I call laser, the process by which I build the foundation from the beginning. Laser is an acronym standing for learning, accuracy, sections, exams, and review. So essentially drilling followed by pacing followed by endurance. And this obviously seems very different on the face of it than training for an athletic competition. But Chris, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts about what might apply from one space to the other. I know that you're working with a lot of athletes and you're seeing how some folks might just want to jump into game day practice, but others recognize the importance of building those skills and drilling them relentlessly. So I'd love to get some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I think you hit it right on the head when you like the whole laser acronym, because like any athlete will know, like without that laser focus, whether that be on the field, in the weight room, or in the film room, it's really hard for you to become a productive player or to be a player in itself that is ready to take that next step and to take on that challenge, right? And you hear it time and time again, whether that be through your coaches, your weight room trainer, your teammates that want better of you, there's always that component of being locked in, locked in, focus, having that laser focus. And I think I like the acronym a lot because not only is the acronym pretty spot on, but the word in and of itself it, it, it translates so well similarly to like an athlete in, the, in that field because, again, there's always this constant emphasis on being focused and having that laser focus, whether that be in the playbook or on the field or what have you. And I think that same laser focus is what can make athletes a little bit more, a, li a little bit more ready to take on something like the LSAT because you just have to apply that same laser focus towards this LSAT prep. And I think you hit it right on the head with your sentiments. Exactly. Thank you for that. Um, one thing that I want to focus on as well is the what not to do. And so for me, I noticed it with the idea of like obsessively trialing or testing things out, getting the feedback, and then just doing it again and getting feedback again. There's this idea in the startup world about vanity metrics, like having tons and tons of followers on social may not translate into revenue or translate into impact. A lot of it could be lower quality noise over the signal, over the actionable information. So I saw that in exam prep as well, taking practice tests and knowing the number and moving on. I'm wondering how that applied to you in your athletic pursuits. Yeah. And even athletic, like the LSAT in itself to, to this day, I still get some PTSD when somebody <laughs> mentions the LSAT, but uh, I think what was important is finding different strategies to help me be successful. And again, similarly to my athletic pursuits, if there was, if I was running a route against a defensive back and I found that it wasn't working or the way that I was running it wasn't working, it, it, it literally, it's literally insane to not change that up and to not, and, and to not apply something differently to help me succeed. Right. And I think it's the same with the LSAT. Like if you find uh, there's a metric or there's a strategy that you're using that maybe isn't right for you. I think it, it, it does you no good to continue on with that strategy because again, there are tons of different strategies out there. Some may affect, may be more effective than others, but I find like that consistency with a strategy that works 
whether that be, and again, that's something that can be applied to the field. That's something that can be applied off the field. Finding something that works for you and being consistent within that realm, I think that's how you become a little bit more beneficial in your pursuits. Right, right. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it, Chris. So I'd love for you to share a bit more about your journey, both athletically and then with regard to pursuing law school itself. I'm sure folks would be interested to hear more about your background and folks feel free to ask questions as well. Feel free to type in the chat or we'll open it up to Q&A over voice afterwards too. Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, my background, I played football growing up, um, grew up in Brampton, went to Queens for four years. And when I did get to Queens, there was there was this sense that I was strictly a football player and I knew how to work hard and I knew how to like keep that work ethic piece in order to get results. But I knew how to do that in one realm, right? I knew how to do that when it came to me being a football player. And for my first and even my second year, although I, my grades in school were fine, there wouldn't, there wasn't really that effort component in regards to work ethic and the same work ethic that I applied to football. And I was seeing results on the field. And again, my school grades were fine, but I knew I could do better. I just didn't care to do better. So I think going into my third year, I started to realize that if I apply myself similarly in the way I do in football or the way I do in the community, what have you, and I do use that same effort in regards to my athletic pursuits, I think I would see a a, a much more of an impact. So I think for me, me choosing to go to law school again, I people ask me this quite often. Like I didn't know I wanted to go to law school, maybe until my fourth year. And I know that's a that's pretty late for a lot of people who like I know I was a political science major. So a lot of people kind of have that penciled in before they even start their first couple of classes. But for me, I was kind of just riding the way because I was an athlete, right? And I would focus on the other piece when the athletic portion was over. And again, I I feel like that was a bit detrimental to a sense because there's no rule or limitation that says that you can't equally apply yourself to different realms. And I think once I learned that and once I got that to kind of click in my brain, I became a a much more well-rounded human being. And that alone allowed me to to get into law school, to to reach all these other different pursuits that before I didn't necessarily think was possible. And another thing I want to touch on is growing up in Brampton and from a relatively low income area, uh, then going to Queens, there was this piece of me that kind of thought that like law school was not really attainable, right? You hear of these high costs, you hear of these fees and what have you. And that's why I like to stress. And I know I released a video on my account called how to take the LSAT for free because there was videos like that. And also different strategies like that, that made it more of a reality for me, right? And having that and also applying for fee waivers. And again, if anyone who's watching this video, if you feel like you want to apply for a fee waiver in regards to your application or in regards to your ELSA, I implore you not only to message me, but to check out my account and go and watch those videos. Because once you remove that cost effective barrier, it, it, it helps you in strides that are pretty that are very beneficial because again, you're removing these barriers and these obstacles that allow other people of lower socioeconomic status and other minorities to kind of make that, make that jump into a field that they're not necessarily comfortable in. Right. So that was a huge thing for me. And another huge thing in regards to, before we open up the the court, the questions in regards to like the application process, I felt for me, and this will go for anyone, but for me, well, what, what made me different is the fact that I was an athlete, right? And I think everybody has something that makes them different. So I know there's some people in here, whether they're athletes or they're entrepreneurs or they have fitness accounts or what it is, you have something that a lot of people may not have. And the reason I emphasize that is because once you start applying to law school, like I know the secret's out, but pretty much everyone's pretty exceptional, right? Like you have people who have done their masters or traveled to Europe or are entrepreneurs. Like you have this large field of people and let's say you cut half those people and you still have 50% of people who are pretty exceptional in their own right. And you have to kind of appeal to the person that's reading your application. And it's what is it that makes me different that allow this person to maybe set my application aside or to bring that to the next level or the next stage of review. So I implore anybody, again, anyone who's watching this, 
that once you find that niche or that thing that makes you different, really frame that issue, right? Really frame it because that, that, that component in and of itself could be the deciding factor whether you get in or whether you don't get in because grades, LSAT, of course, and I know Steve will tell you there's many strategies in regards to making uh, your score better. And again, the LSAT's a pretty learnable test, but what, what, what makes it difficult is when people simply want to get in because they're numbers, right? And when, when you get into that, that field, that category, you're, now you've opened up the competition so large that there's a lot of people who have great grades, right? There's a lot of people who have done well in the LSAT, but is there a lot of people who have good grades, a good LSAT score, and that little special component that makes them different? So for me, that was one thing that was huge, and I wanted to put that out there because obviously the people in here, whether they're in law school or aspiring to be in law school, they want to try their best to frame their application to, to, to induce success. And one of the key points that I always hit on is just framing that uniqueness about yourself and really, really emphasizing that within your application. Fantastic, Chris. Thanks for sharing that. And folks, feel free to submit questions as they come up. Um, we have a question for, for um, Don Tal. Uh, Chris, in regards to the LSAT, how did you manage to stay disciplined to manage your time with football, training, and the LSAT? Well, um, so to be honest with you, that space and time where I was studying for the LSAT and training for football and trying to keep my grades up, that might have been the hardest period of time that I've ever had to endure. But there was something that I kept reminding myself of, and that was that the pain of regret is far greater than the pain of discipline, right? And I think reminding myself that of that mantra kind of daily allowed me to understand what's important and to really dive in and to hone in on those things that are important. Because again, I knew that I wanted to get into law school and I knew that that would take time, effort, work, what have you. And knowing that, and knowing that I'm going to do everything I can do to control that, I think that's really what helped push me and helped motivate me because without that, I could be looking back and the, the, just the thought of regretting not trying hard enough is something that I wouldn't be able to forgive myself, right? Like I really wouldn't be able to forgive myself. So I think just having that thought process be constantly in my mind was something that helped propel me to wanting to do better and to help put in maximum effort to ensure that whether I get in or whether I don't get in, I can never look back and regret the way, the manner in which I went about it or regret the fact that I didn't get in because there's always this, this thought process that I did everything I could to ensure that what, wherever the cards fall, I did everything in my power to, to give myself the best probability. Chris, you sound like you're reminding me a little bit of myself in certain ways. You consider yourself a kind of like all or nothing person. Yeah, man. <laughs> then that's the thing, right? And this, I feel like there's something where if you're going to try something, right. And kind of regardless of what it is, like if you're going to try something for me personally, I think it's beneficial to put in your full effort because there's nothing worse. And there's been scenarios, even with myself in the past, where there's nothing worse than looking back and thinking, you know what? I probably could have done better had I tried harder. And I think I mentioned earlier in my third and fourth years when I really started to really apply myself. And again, I saw my marks kind of skyrocket in a sense because I was applying myself fully to my education. And although this time like I, I was fortunate enough to have it work out, there was always that thought in the back of my mind, like, man, if I took first and second year a little bit more seriously, I wouldn't, I, I would have a much better chance in regards to my last school applications. So again, there's that, there's that component and that feeling of regret that I, that I just hate to feel, you know, and I think that's what propels me. Well, what, what you're making me think of here, and then we'll get to this other question in the chat. Um, I'm thinking about the idea of being at the intersection of multiple areas. So you're an athlete, you're also pursuing law school, but whatever helps you succeed in athletics, like the discipline to block off time on your schedule for training or to wake up at the crack of dawn before it gets too hot outside in the summer to train, whatever it is, to obviously pr pursue very difficult workouts, all of that. Like if you can do that in one area, there's no reason that you can't do that in two areas or three or five. Like you could master the football training process. Then you could manage the process of studying for the LSAT. Then you could apply that same drive to the personal statement and the other parts of the application. They're different topics, different niches, but the drive behind it and the skills in terms of 
blocking off the time to make it a priority and to make it happen, to me, it seems like it's not that much different. So if you're doing one thing, you can automatically do five things. It's either exactly. zero or it's a lot of things, but it doesn't just have to stop at one. Exactly. And that's exactly it, right? Because if you could get up at six o'clock in the morning, five times a week to get to your football workout, you can get up at six o'clock in the morning to study for your LSAT. You know what I mean? Like it, it's very similar in regards to the, the, the mental, the mindset. And Steve, a question for you. I know me studying for the LSAT, like, again, I mentioned earlier, like, I still get some jitters when people bring that test up. And I think you being an LSAT coach, obviously, what have you found are some of the more effective strategies in regards to prospective students who are, I guess, looking to do well on that test? Yeah, well, I think sticking on this theme of scheduling and blocking off time, one of my most popular guides are my day-by-day -day study plans, breaking down exactly what to do every single day over the course of your prep. So I talked about obsession, the obsessive practice exam narrative versus laser. Laser being the good way to go about things. And my study plans incorporate that framework, showing you how to learn the basics of the exam, focusing on accuracy, doing questions by type, all the way through to full length timed exams. My courses also follow that same structure and they include a special day by day guide. And I also talk about breaking up time within your day itself. So let's say during COVID, you're not working whatever, hypothetically, and you have all day to study, how do you make the most of that day while still having balance and accounting for personal life? So you could do two and a half hours before lunch, two and a half hours after lunch, but you block it off to ensure that it definitely happens. And then afterwards, you can relax. But it's all about making it manageable chunks piece by piece. Now, we got a question for you as well on the application process. So what do you wish you'd known before starting? Um, it's a good question. I think honestly, what one thing that if I could go back, because again, the huge thing for me and the one thing that I did do was the cost, like to minimize the cost as much as possible, whether that with LSAT or application, because I, again, didn't pay for the LSAT. I maybe pay, paid to apply to like two schools. And I had friends who paid for the LSAT twice, paid to apply to six or seven schools. And when I only paid maybe $300, they paid 1400 you know? So that was one thing that I really, really stressed because again, those costs is what allows it to be a barrier. But another thing that perhaps that I, I if I could do things differently, I think I, I, maybe I would apply more broadly because um, getting into law school in itself, again, like we know the difficulties of getting into law school. And I think I was pretty set in regards to like going to school in Ontario and I think I applied to maybe like four or five schools, but especially, I know Steve, this is a little bit different in the States, but in Canada, like every law school for the most part is a pretty reputable law school. And I think if you really want to go to law school, like there's other avenues out there that will help you in that regard. So I would say not limiting yourself to a few schools, but really ensuring to like apply broadly, even if that means like UBC or Calgary, what have you, because again, that JD is the JD and where you article is a little bit more important as to where you go to school. And if you can make the right connections, then once you're in law school, like you could, you have the degree to access those spaces. So I think maybe I would have applied a little bit more broadly looking back at it. Well, that's, that's good advice. Yeah. Applying to more schools, especially if you can get application fee waivers, speaking of fee waivers, is not a bad thing either. A lot of schools will give you that fee waiver. So you save a hundred bucks or more per school. All you've got to do is ask and send an email and they do often say yes. Another thing I want to call out is the role of the networking and the hustling. I think people underestimate that role when they're applying and they fail to recognize that the name on the resume from your school will only get you so far. You can't just shell out tons of money in tuition and expect it to open all the doors in the world for you. The spending 10 hours on LinkedIn, which hardly anybody does, would actually have a much bigger impact in terms of laying the groundwork for those relationships to help you get jobs upon graduation. Exactly. And if I may, I would just want to add one more thing. One thing that was also like really, really beneficial is having people close to you read your personal statements because, and sorry, not only having people close to you, having people that also, again, that maybe don't know you as well as well because again when you have people who who know you of course there's that aspect of like they can kind of fill the gaps 
where a law school probably couldn't, right? Like if you have someone who's close to it, a close friend reads your personal statement and maybe like something's missing in this story because again, in this application process, like you're framing something, like you're framing yourself and you're making yourself look as attractive as possible, right? So one thing that I did was I, uh, I would go to the writing center and I would literally find people who would be interested in reading my personal statement and I would just see if it, they were compelled by it. And I think that's important because again, the people who are reading your applications, they have no idea who you are, right? Like they're reading this for the first time. They're finding out who Perry is for the very first time. So I think it's important to, to put yourself in that situation and let someone that maybe isn't as close to you as well, but that you know is, I guess, that, that can that will be able to obtain that information in regards to a writing center or an adult or maybe a professor that you trust and let them let them read that. Because I think that the, the advice that they give you will be a lot different than a close friend as well because they don't have the same the same information to fill those gaps in. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. So given that you want someone the admissions office doesn't know you very well, I would actually say maybe you want to find some people to read your statement who also don't know you very well and see if that personal touch still comes across. And the writing center is a great idea. And I imagine even during COVID, they're still operating just over email perhaps, but not enough people seek them out and they could help you with your personal statement. So why wouldn't you take them up on that, on that offer? And I see Chloe in the chat asking how long you spent writing it. So it was, this is a weird story. I never really told anyone this, but I guess you guys are getting the exclusive. Um, I actually remember it was weird. There was this time in the summer where I just had this inclination that I wanted to go to law school. And I think it was my summer of third year. I just said, you know, I, I think I want to go to law school. So I remember in like June or July, I remember getting up and just like typing away on my computer, like things that I wanted to say. And it was weird because I like typed out a good chunk of that. I didn't look at it again until like September. And then when it, it came time to it, where people were, writing their personal statements i went back to this document i was like oh i've already got like three-fourths of it written out i could just understand this part maybe tweak this part a bit and, and and this is good to go and i think why that's important because you don't want to spend a week two weeks writing this application right because this uh, this personal statement is so important like it, it's hard to understate the value of the statement because again grades lsat score like these are things that there's no, what's, what's the word for, there's, there's no personal value to it, right? Like it's just, it's, it's numbers at the end of the day, but the personal statement itself, like you're, for the first time, you're giving the admissions committee a chance to get to know who the applicant is. And I think when something has that much significance, you don't want to spend a week on it, two weeks on it. You want to spend a month, maybe two months tweaking it, tweaking it just to make sure that when I read I think it's 750 words. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But when I read those pages, I I feel like I know you. You know what I mean? To, to some extent. I feel like I understand why you want to get into law school. I feel that, that empathy. And I think you need that in order to help make yourself exceptional. So, like, it took me, I guess, a couple, a couple months because the, the the time I started. But I also do know some people who weren't as successful that – again, wrote it in a couple of weeks. And not to say that you can't be, but I'm saying that with something is this important, this significant to your application, if you could just start writing things out as soon as possible, and even if you're not going to use it or not, but just stuff that you feel like you want to say, I would, I would, I would start and just start framing and tweaking that, that process. Yeah. I think a few months is definitely more along the lines of what you want to do. If not for simply the fact that those few months, you write it, a draft, you just pour it out, you put it away, then you come back to it later with a fresh perspective because you have a little bit of distance. And I've actually been thinking a lot, about the, a lot about the personal statement recently because students in my courses have been asking for help with it. So I've actually integrated personal statement workshops inside the course. I've done a few public sessions for YouTube as well just to show folks the process of critiquing those, helping to improve them, and then also having students critique as well. So we get a variety of perspectives to help make sure that that personal voice is shining through. And Steve, just a quick question for you, actually, before we get to that question in the chat. Again, because you can't necessarily understate the value of a personal statement, is there a 
tips or tricks that you would suggest for someone, I guess like a little quick tidbit of, I don't know that you have more extensive information available, but a little tidbit information for someone who what, understood the importance of this, of this personal statement, what would you recommend they do to ensure the most success possible? Well, I think the tendency is to try and summarize all the most impressive things from the resume. And so I would encourage folks to take the opposite approach and make it more like it's sharing something deeply personal and then tying it back to law school, which means that it could be, it could make you feel a little bit uncomfortable sometimes to share just that much. But I find that folks tend too much in the other direction. So I'd rather them share more and then we can adjust it accordingly. But it does require, again, some perspective, some distance, and being willing to have others read it over to make sure it's portraying you in the best possible light that's still personal as well. And we've got a question for you about giving advice to a young person who wants to follow the, that path of the athletics and the law student path. Well, to a young person that kind of wants to follow this athlete law path, I think the first thing I would do is tell them to follow Switch Mentality on Instagram. And Share more about that. What is Switch YouTube. Mentality? What's that all about? Um, so again, and I think this kind of leads to the question, like Switch Mentality, I know for me, I know I kind of mentioned before, I was an athlete and that's all I was. And I think once there was a time where that kind of got taken away from me, I realized that I didn't necessarily know who I was outside of that. Like I've been in a sense on this pedestal for such a long time that I didn't even bother to think that once this pedestal shatters, then what do I become? You know what I mean? Like who is Chris the person as opposed to Chris the athlete? And I think switch mentality helps spread that message because again, like I said, like there's the one regret I have is looking back into my earlier years and not really taking the educational part seriously. And I think the, the reason I, I, of course it's, it is a regret, but it's also a learning experience. Right. And I think what I learned from that is if you apply yourself in a way in which you feel is equally beneficial in multiple realms, you can only open more doors for yourself, right? And in doing that, you increase your your potential for success. So switch mentality is kind of reinforcing that message to not limit yourself to that to that realm of athletics, but to really allow yourself to experience different fields. So to that young kid or that would want that advice, I would honestly tell them to not be afraid to fail because when you expose yourself to new realms and new areas there's gonna be some downside you know there's definitely gonna be some ugliness but within that there's never gonna be a moment of regret the whether you succeed in there whether you don't if you succeed in it well you succeed in it good for you now you found a new path that you could i guess um kind of bask within but if you fail in it you've learned something from that experience that you can take with you to this next path that you're going on. So I guess just being not being afraid or being not afraid to fail is one of the key aspects because again, there's just so much you can get out of actually doing and actually trying as opposed to watching. And there was a video that I posted the other day where Kanye West basically said that he was a motivator for the doers because to anybody who actually does, they know how hard it is to actually do. And I think if you adopt that mindset and you understand that it's difficult to do, but you try it anyway, I think that's so beneficial because there's whether you, again, like I stated before, whether you feel it, whether you don't, you're taking something from that experience, no, regardless of your success in that endeavor. Very wise words. Yeah, you learn more from the failures than for, from the successes. And that certainly applies to the LSAT realm as well. If you're only doing easy problems and getting them right, you're not learning anything. The tough problems are where you gain those insights to apply to future ones. Exactly. So, Steve, I actually had a quick question for you, actually, because I heard a couple of different things when I was studying for the LSAT. And um, what I, because obviously within the LSAT, within these sections, there are easier questions and there's some more difficult questions, right? And I've heard advice to maybe tackle the hard questions first because it gives you some time because the easier questions you only need 30, 40 seconds. I've heard advice to tackle all the easier questions first because, or to really take your time with those easier questions because a right answer is a right answer. So I guess there's this bit of a clash in regards to how to go about these, the, these, these scenarios and these sections. So what would you advise in that, in that sphere? 
Yeah, well, given that they're all worth the same, I don't see a reason to do the harder ones first. You don't want to do the harder ones and run out of time, never even getting to the easier ones. And getting the easy ones right, picking up some easy points could keep that morale going. So I would recommend knocking out the easier ones, and which really means generally just doing questions in the order given. Because at least in logical reasoning, they're from easy to hard, broadly speaking. And the same goes for the other sections too, more or less. So I would just do them in order. And then if you encounter a tough one, flag it, skip it, come back to it later. But yeah, I think the morale boost is incredibly important. We had a question here on obtaining academic references. you have anything to share on that? So this was probably one of the more difficult parts of the application process because again, in my earlier years, yeah, I would go to class and I would pay attention, but to ask someone to write a reference on your behalf, there's something that you, and sorry, to ask someone to write a good reference on your behalf, you want to be engaged in that class and you want to have somewhat of a relationship with that professor. And I think what helped me is, again, not being afraid to participate because there was a time and there was certain classes where, it, of course, it's easier to sit in the back and to kind of just take your notes and, and leave. But there are certain classes, I know if you've done a seminar as well, like you, you're given the opportunity to participate. And I think if you've done that, the professor will always appreciate that, right? And once you kind of create that appreciation, just going in and I, I remember going into um, my professor's office and I was like sweating from <laughs> from head to toe. I'm like, man, like, I don't know, he's not gonna, he's gonna say no. Like, there's no way he's, he's gonna do it for me. But I found that he was happy to do it for me. And I think the reason that, that that was because he, again, this whole mindset capability of like not being afraid to fail. And again, the same thing applies in regards to obtaining an academic reference. Like if, if you were a person who was maybe a little bit more quiet in regards to these classes and you didn't maybe build that relationship with these profs, I would message every prof that I did relatively well in and give them the understanding that you're, you're applying to law school you would be, you loved their teaching style and you felt that if there was any teacher that could speak to the testaments of you as a student, it would be them. And given that, would it be possible for you to write me a reference? And I think really showing that you learned from their class and that they, if anyone has the best insight as to you as a student, as an applicant, I think those are the props that I would definitely go after and just shoot them an email. And the worst thing they can say is no. Yeah, the ones who know you well. Yeah. Exactly. Let's see a question on when to time yourself on LSAT questions, when to start timing yourself. I'll take this one and then Chris, I'll invite you to share also. Yeah. Uh, I'd say after you, you've built a foundation and familiarity with that question type, folks typically want to time themselves too early, time themselves too soon, especially when it comes to individual questions. You don't, you never want to time yourself on an individual logical reasoning question or even individual game because those are only average amounts of time. Some reasoning questions are easier, some are harder. So you can't just say they should all be one minute and 22 seconds or whatever it is. You can't say all games should be 845. So I would never time the individual questions. And then the sections, I would never time myself until having built a good foundation and knowing what the proper way is to approach that particular question type of Chris, in your journey, did you, when did you start timing yourself and did you feel it was too early, too late? What was that like for you? So this is a bit funny because I'm a very competitive person. So a couple of sessions, I thought I was good to time it because like I, I, I'm behind if I did it. And honestly, I found I was a little bit counterproductive. So I don't remember an exact time as when I start, when I said that I would start timing myself, but I know that it did take me a while to make sure that I understood the questions before I started timing because timing and finishing with 10 questions left doesn't really work with your morale in regards to morale booster. So I waited until I had like a better understanding of the questions and then I started timing. Nice. No, it sounds like you, you've got, you've got it there. What about um, methods, methods for different sections of the exam? Is there one method that's truly the best? Well, of course, mine. Mine's the best. Uh, <laughs> I'm wondering, I guess, I guess there's questions around, I, I'm going to take this instead in the direction of like debates or dilemmas or things like, 
a logical reasoning question stem verse first versus stimulus first. That's a kind of a hot topic where you have tons of top scorers on both sides. What about you, Chris? Are you question stem first or stimulus first? So this was this was odd for me because I would and to my detriment, I was going back and forth a bit. And I think I kind of I started um, settling on the question stem first because I thought and again, it's, it wasn't really consistent to, again, to my detriment, but I like to have some idea of what I was looking for before I started looking. And I think like, okay, for example, when I was like a strengthening type question and I read like, well, how do you strengthen this question? When I read the question and then went to go read the stimulus, I, I'm read, I'm right away, I'm looking for different things as to like what needs to be strengthened, right? And so I think it does have its merits, but at the same time, I think this is something that for me personally, it's just a comfort thing. Like what are you most comfortable with in regards to um, obtaining that information? So I think I was a question stem person first, but I, I, I think this is just solely comfort, but maybe Steve, maybe you have a different um, opinion, but I think this was a comfort thing. Yeah, I actually think it's a comfort thing too. I think it doesn't really matter that much. I used to read stimulus first, now I read questions them first because I kind of realized that I just tended that way naturally and it worked for me. So it's fun. I got a top score reading stimulus first. I get top scores not reading questions them first. I think it doesn't really matter. So in, in this particular case, that's kind of a debate. I think there's no one best way go, to go about it. Like anything, you can try it out a handful one way, a handful the other way and see what ends up working better for you. So Steve, I actually got another question for you. So when I did the LSAT, it was in paper format. And I know that I was perhaps the last class to really have that paper option. And now they've moved to a digital, a digital um, type of component, if I'm correct about that. So when, what have you heard in regards to this digital, this digital LSAT in comparison to this paper LSAT? What are those key differences for people in here who are thinking about taking that, that LSAT that's going to be digital that you think would um, maybe help them in their, in their LSAT pursuits? Yeah, sure. So it's been a big change, a couple of big changes in the past year. It was They transitioned from paper and pencil to digital in July and September of 2019. So about a year ago, it, they made it from paper to digital on a tablet, specifically Microsoft Surface Go. You would go into the test center and take it there. Then due to COVID this year, they moved it online. They had to cancel the March and April LSATs. And then they quickly came up with this new format called the LSAT Flex, where you're doing it at home, online, from your own computer, not a tablet. And they're watching you with a webcam and microphone for security purposes. So very different. As far as big takeaways, the Flex, it's only three sections, not five. So it's a lot shorter. You're done in two hours, no break, three sections back to back. And it's all on a screen. So you're not drawing on the tablet. You're not drawing on the test booklet. You're now doing all your work on scratch paper to the side. So those are a couple of big changes. So would you recommend then, now that this is like this whole digital form format, would you recommend that to do practice LSAT test on your computer or is that something you still want to do on with pencil and paper? No, I would do it on the computer. I would do it, whatever is most similar to your actual format, that's what you should do. And who knows, maybe if COVID ends sometime soon, they'll go back to doing it in person on the tablet. But for now, we can only assume that it'll be online from home with the flex for the foreseeable future. So LSAC, the people who make the LSAT, they've published over 60 exams in that digital LSAT format, which is the same as the flex format, same kind of software, same annotation tools for things like highlighting and underlining, a countdown timer and all that. So if you go on LSAC's site, you can get that subscription to get all of those exams in that digital format. Yeah, I'd recommend it. I share a little bit about your 1L journey. What's happening for you? Yeah, so law school in of itself is difficult. Like I kind of, I think you kind of know that going in. Like law school is very difficult. But I found that for me, like it was one of the first times where I was getting something out of putting in all this work. And when I say getting something, I don't mean necessarily mean grades. I mean actual tangible skills. And I think that was so important because it didn't feel like I was writing a 20 page paper to write a 20 page paper. It felt that I was writing a legal memorandum that I could apply five, 10 years from now and I'm learning how to do practical things. So again, with professional school, there's this, 
this impact where you're actually learning things that you're going to take with you into the legal world. And I think that was so helpful for me because it made me realize that the things that we're doing, there's a point to it. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions, and this is just to be honest, is that people think that if you go to law school, like you're going to walk out with a pretty high paying job. So that, and in Canada at least, isn't necessarily true. Like, and I say this because like law school is, again, it's a very expensive endeavor um, in regards to tuition and everything else that comes with it. And if the main focus is money, I, I, I which I get, like I understand that there's definitely a route that you could take to ensure that you, 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 meet, you meet those requirements. But at the same time, I would, te- I would want you to tread carefully because to get those high paying money jobs, again, is, which not I think to shy away from, but there's a lot of competition within those jobs, of course. And anytime you have a scenario where most people want something, there's a the whole um, supply and demand aspect where there's just not enough spaces if, to accommodate everyone. So not everyone's going to get that lucrative Bay Street job. Some people are going to end up working in the city or what have you. And given that, you're, the, the, you don't want to regret going to law school because you wanted to make a certain salary and now you're not for the time being and you think it was a waste of time or you're in debt and you, again, you think it was a waste of time. So I would say to note, once you make your mind up to apply law school, again, the money is an important factor. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and tell you that the money wasn't a consideration when I was applying, but there was a lot of other things that I enjoyed that made law school something that I wanted to do. So I think really analyze your decision in regards to going to law school and ensuring that would you still be happy if you perhaps didn't get one of those more lucrative gigs? And if the answer is yes, then go right ahead. But if the answer is no, I would take some time to make sure this is really what you want because there's always the possibility that you may not get what you're looking for in regards to um, compensation. Or at least you have to have a very clear path towards ensuring that you're gonna get that. And so that comes back to what we were discussing earlier regarding networking, LinkedIn, exactly. all the hustle, all of that good stuff. Sorry, I just noticed one last question. I think you would, could uh, maybe uh, speak to this about rest days for LSAT studying. And I guess, this, of course, you have like, your schedules and whatnot, but would you recommend rest days and how many of them? Or is that something that, is it just like a three hour a day type of thing, regardless of the day? Or how would you go about that? Yeah, I think rest days are always important. And I think the same is true in the athletic world. I mean, you don't want to burn out. You don't want to do too much. You don't want to be sick of this. And you need time to rest and recuperate and process whatever it is that you've learned. And so don't err on the side of doing too much. Also don't do too little though. So not every day should be a rest day. But if you need to do at least one little thing every day, sure, you could do a problem or two on an off day and be fine. But I wouldn't aim to do it for anything other than continuing that momentum. Yeah, I agree. I, I know I took at least one rest day every week because I was just mentally fatigued and drained. So I needed some time to kind of replenish my brain. And last thing I'll say about uh, switch mentality before I know, Steve, we got to wrap this up. Um, to anyone watching this that feels that they're kind of stuck in this realm or they're stuck in this place where society has told them that you could only be one thing or you could only be in a certain sphere or a certain realm, I think you definitely want to follow switch mentality because the whole purpose of the account is to kind of reintegrate the way in which people think and to kind of rewire, re- rewire those, 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 those processes that allow you to think that way. And I think that's significant because again, and I say this time and time again, I was a person who only cared about one thing. And I think that it, it it kind of restricted me in a sense because I wasn't able to fully grow as a person. And I think now the reason I try to preach that message so often and so readily is because I realize the benefit you get of trying new things. And again, whether you're successful, or you're unsuccessful, the trying is so important because it allows you to, again, uh, obtain these skills that you otherwise wouldn't have. So if you're in a situation or a scenario in which you feel kind of stuck within the realm that you've always been in, again, I implore you, implore you to not only follow, but to reach out to me and talk with me and see if we could get you on a path that allows you to explore different avenues.
That's a very generous offer. And I would definitely encourage folks to hit you up for that. I'm sure that they will. And they'll, they'll find this very valuable. So thanks for sharing your perspective, Chris. And thanks for inviting me to share mine as well. Let's, let's keep this going. So follow Chris on Switch Mentality for more of that. And for me, folks can find me, Steve Schwartz, over at the LSAT blog, as well as the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast, Facebook group, Instagram. I'm putting out tons of, tons of information all the time, including covering the new LSAT Flex and all the recent policy changes there as well. And if there's anything we didn't get to on the LSAT side, folks can feel free to reach out to me to cover that and feel free to reach out to Chris for anything on the life of a student athlete. Thanks everyone for joining. Feel free to reach out to either of us if you have questions as appropriate and we'll do what we can to help you. Absolutely. Thanks for watching y'all and always remember you're built different. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.